Hey, it's Wednesday night. It's notebook wagering time live from the Salisbury Center fueled by Monster Energy. I am Smitty. Sitting across from me is my co-host here in studio, Q. What's going on, Q? Another hot day in the sauna here at the Salisbury Center. We're getting used to it, though. It's it's not as bad as it's been. So it's kind of like Florida weather. You move there for a week, it's hot, and then after the second week, you're good. I can't wait, man. I got a physical coming up, and the doctor is going to look at me and just say, man, you've lost a lot of weight, and it's because working outside, doing a podcast <laughs> in here, I love it. I'm We're not doing some... hot yoga. We're doing hot radio, <laughs> hot the new radio. trend. I love... <laughs> See, I'm kind of comfortable tonight. I don't think it's, it's that. Yeah, it feels... we're getting used to it. I think it's nice down there. Adaptation. Okay, here we go. We got our guy up in Pittsburgh, man. Let's go to Jason first. How are you doing, Jason? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Looking for my golf picks. We've got a little quiet week here. All the radio hosts are all off because there's nothing to bet on. So it's kind of like trying to find something. I know you've kind of dove into some other things, Smitty, but uh, I have not dabbled <laughs> anything else. I have not gone to NBA Summer League yet, but uh, get ready for baseball to start back up at the end of the week. <laughs> I'll jump into that later. People, I have not dove into a lot. I did the I did the All-Star game. I had the National League last night, and I do have a Canadian football league play for tomorrow. <laughs> you know what's really <laughs> taking a world by storm right now in the betting world is that Premier League lacrosse. Seems like a lot of people on Twitter are kind of playing that. Uh, I, I don't have odds on that. Oh, they're all over... Okay, well, not on my book. Okay, uh, okay. I, somebody. That's because okay. you're you're in a piggy bank book. <laughs> okay, so here, we, yeah, maybe I don't know, but here you go, man. That's your new research. I got to figure it out. That Went out. from Mexican baseball to PLL. Okay, Maddie, what's going on out there in Pittsburgh? Are you guys complaining that it's actually hot? It's pretty hot up here in Pittsburgh, man. Ninety today. Humidity is high. It's good for Jason, you. Uh, I want to give Jason a little shout out too. He's doing some like treasure of Oak Island hunting around Pittsburgh or something. Nah, he's looking for some kind of idol like Indiana Jones or something. I'm not sure what he's got going on. <laughs> Man, it is slow times. I love it. it, it is is way. Dog days of summer, boys. <laughs> it is tough finding things to talk about. But no, we, hey, we have a great guest here tonight. Uh, we got our guy, um, former major league pitcher Josh Towers that's been on the show many He's been a times. regular. Yeah, yeah, man. He is becoming a regular man. And we always really enjoy him on. Hey Josh, what's going on, my friend? How are you tonight? What's up, gentlemen? How are you? Um, we're doing great, man. We had Josh on right April April? Right before I think it was right before opening day. Okay, maybe March then. Yeah. A couple months. It was right before opening day. So hey Josh, let's just dive into it because we know you are a busy guy here. Um let's I my first question, I'll go first here, is all the role changes and everything with that with the pitch clock, and we talked about that last time we had you on, the bigger bases and everything like that. Overall for the first half of baseball. What's your overall thoughts on the new changes? Do you like them or would you change? I saw something today. Some of the players want the pitch clock to change in the playoffs. Just overall, what's your opinion on what's happening so far in the first half of baseball with the, the changes? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was obviously it's all the talk at spring training, so we get excited about what's new and it gives us something to write or talk about or tweet about or whatever. Um, I've kind of tried to consciously like not think about any of it. I think it's what happens when we're playing too, is we get these new rule changes and then we, we have to learn about them in order to know how to use them or truly manipulate them, to be honest with you. Uh, and then you kind of just dismiss them. So like you'll see games where there might be a pretty heavy topic on something, but the guys on the field look like they don't care about it or when they give some sort of you know mid-game interview or post-game interview it's like we it's like we don't even address whatever the hot topic is and it's kind of how it's approached like there's nothing we can do about it outside of learn how to use the rules if the new rule changes to our advantage and then you go um things that i kind of look at like things that are kind of interesting to me and, and i pulled it up here so I, I wasn't too far off on it but it's it's little things like if i'm looking at stats in baseball right um the, the Cleveland Indians, like, so what's the talk, right? It's, it's home runs. It's hit home runs. It's hit home runs. Everybody wants to hit home runs. Nobody cares if we strike out. Uh, we get paid off of home runs. And then every analytical stat in the world suggests that, I mean, look at home run derby. Look at the All-Star game. Exit velocity, right? Like every, somebody posted something betting on the home run derby in the last X amount of winners all had exit velos of, let's say, 116 and above with 
uh, an age of this, right, under like a young age. I mean, just things to try to find ways to thrust to win. Um, and it's interesting when you hear people talking about stuff like this, like everything's based on hitting home runs and exit velocity, and, and we're teaching today's youth, in essence, the wrong way to approach baseball, I think. So then, I don't logically, we don't really think about a lot. I, I, my boys are both in college, and they're both trying to get drafted, and, you know, next year when they're eligible, and there's different things, and I, I just look at the way everybody perceives stuff, and it's we're so good at reading the cover of the book and not much past that. And and so my point is, is home runs are the end all be all. And if you're not hitting home runs, then how are you going to be successful? And then you look at teams like the Cleveland Guardians. I think they have 60 home runs on the season as a team. It's by far the least amount in baseball. Right, the next closest team is the Nationals with 78, and then you go to the top of the heap, which is the Atlanta Braves with 169. The Cleveland Indians are, or Guardians, sorry, they're in first place. Like, this team can't hit a home run. It, I mean, Aaron Judge has more home runs last year than they have currently. Like, this team doesn't hit home runs. How are they in first place? Like, how are they winning? What is it based on? We always look at things so wrong when we're talking about baseball through the course of the season because pitching and defense is the end-all, be-all to what wins and losses are to us. And one of the interesting topics to me, again, is the Cleveland Indians who cannot hit a home runs. I'm sure half of those are um, uh, by their left-handed power hitter and but yet this team's in first place. I find it very fascinating. Josh, kind of to sec to tie that in. So it seems like it's all trendy, right? Like baseball, it's the topic of the year. Like you just talked about this year, it's like launch angle, exit velo. That's the trend, right? Um, yeah, I what would you say when you were pitching was the trend of baseball? Like how did what were you hearing? Uh, you know, was it uh, you know downhill pitchers? Was it pain? You know pitch location uh hitting wise what kind of what from launching or exit velo to what you had what's the difference pick a topic or sorry should should say more pick a year right like 2001 when i came into it 2002 we had a meeting in 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 our clubhouse uh you can't take steroids no year 2003 we're going to test for steroids <laughs> and if you if you guys pop this x mile we'll test forever if you don't we'll never test again like that that was where our mindset was right like it's such a weird dynamic when i came into the game because we we i i it's like a, there was this transition from men to boys right like you had to you had to earn an invite to big league camp so if you got drafted to go to big league camp that was a big deal like earning like like you didn't just get sent to big league camp. And then all of a sudden that transition from men to boys and all of a sudden, like your first round pick, you just get sent to big league camp. So like our topics were different because we didn't have launch angle or exit velocity. We had none of this stuff. Um, we had sounds of a bat. Like there was different <laughs> ways that we approached it. I remember yeah. Eric Bond did a home run off me one day. Um, and a few years later, we were in Lehigh Valley. And I was in, uh, Raul Labanias was on a triple A assignment for rehab. And he flew out to, to right center field, I remember. And I threw a pitch to Raul Bañez, and I never looked at anything else. I threw the pitch, and he hit it, and I, like I said, I stared at him. But I wasn't really, no disrespect, he asked me afterwards, what was I doing? And I was just staring at him, and he knew he flew out, but he flew out pretty deep, and he, he doesn't get to first base. And all I can process was, I've only heard that sound one other time in my life. <laughs> It was so weird. It was the home run that Barry Bonds hit off. I mean, I just thought, man, there's just certain <laughs> players in our game that were different. And, and we based a lot more off stuff like that. Like, I can tell when you don't hit a ball very hard or when you do or what it sounds like. And, and, and I wanted to know why. Like, that's how we approached, you know, evaluating players and talent and what made people good. It was, it was a whole different mindset. But steroids were such a massive deal. And then guys had to stop taking steroids. And so you saw balls not – quite go as far or leave the yard as much and and so we were we were stuck more at least I was stuck more in that era and then the transition started to change over the next five six seven years uh, just a fascinating time to be honest with you to, to be in the game and go through all the cool stuff that we were going through but again man like <laughs> we wouldn't even have time to talk about any of this nonsense because if we got caught up in something like exit below or launch angle or God knows what, Roy Holiday would have lit us up. You know, Roy, would, <laughs> he worked so hard and studied so hard that if we got caught looking at something foolish like this, or God forbid you didn't run out of a ground ball, we were so afraid of Roy Holiday that, nah, 
we were too busy hustling and, and studying, man. I kind of wish Ball was like that again. Look, I just said that. So here's the deal: we we are we are such an a, a, an era um, of followers. Like, there's I always tell my kids. I know I'm wrong, but I always say, man, I think. 95% of this world of followers is very few leaders. And I know it's a lot less than that, obviously. Um, and Roy was like that again, bringing up Roy. He was a lead by example type of guy, not a verbal leader. He's a lead by example type of guy. And his actions, you know, they spoke a lot. And, and so with, with, the, with the social media aspect, right, it's so easy. We're so cool the way we dress or change, whatever it is that we're doing, whatever's hot in the moment, whatever the trendy topic is, we're so good at following people. Um, and that's the era we live in. And it's not always positive. Like I question, and I don't know, I questioned the third overall pick by the Detroit Tigers. This kid may be really good. I have no idea. I have no idea. He might be really good, but he is so good on social media and he has this presence on social media and he has this style and this flow and he looks fantastic. But then I watch him run routes, chasing balls. And I'm like, that don't look very good to me. That doesn't look very whatever, but is he legit? He's a third overall pick for a reason. Or the Tigers buy into this a little bit? We're going to find out in the near future. But it's easy to get caught up in this stuff. And so I see kids following this. Or the Savannah Bananas, they're awesome. It's so much what a great thing for baseball. But how many of those kids are going to carry that into trying to play their travel team? And how far is that going to go? I'm, I'm curious. But the reason I just got excited, and boys, you know I'm long-winded, uh, <laughs> is this kid in Cincinnati, Ellie De La Cruz. Yeah. Y'all, thank you, thank you, thank you for this man because what did he do the other day? And this is just a baby example. But he stole second, next pitch he steals third, and this is something that I had talked to the Mets about. So so we're going to shift and leave a third baseman way off the line and just let this guy get off as far as he wants. So now my, my attention as a pitcher is diverted because this guy's getting way off. So then it changes some of this stuff that I'm going to do because I can only let him get so far because he's definitely scoring on a, on a weak ground ball or whatever. Like, there's so many little things like this. <clears throat> I remember with the Mets, we, we shifted, but we kept all three guys on the same level, meaning there was no stagger. So when they went left or right after a ball, you and I would immediately take one step and stop because we're going to run into each other. And I was like, y'all, we can't be on the same level. you got to stagger or we're setting them up for failure long term as well. And so it's kind of like what happened there. So he's still second. He's still third. And then he acts like he's putting his helmet on and fixing his hair. He knows where the third baseman is. He watched this. He studied this all game. He watched it all series. He probably watched it last series. And so he's continuing to move his speed, messing with my hair, looks at the pitcher with the tendency. We all tend to see the pitcher puts his head down, and Ellie just takes off. And there's no way you're going to beat him. The excitement is, one, he's heads up. Two, he lived that moment already. I'll give you a Shea Hillenbrad example in a second. And and so, what does he do? Is he takes off? He steals home, knowing that if you love it and love it, there's no way you're going to beat me. You gave me a three twenty-five feet off the base, anyways. So I'm already a third of the way down. The point is this: this kid is hustling. He's busting his, you know what, all the time. He's beating out balls at first base. He's taking pride in getting extra hit. He's taking pride in putting the work in and hustling. We haven't seen this in so long. And Ellie De La Cruz is giving it to us finally for the first time in a long time. And I noticed this in college the other day. Was it college or travel? Maybe the, I don't know what it was, but it couldn't have been college. Maybe it was college. I know they ended recently. A kid did the same thing. He stole home because the catcher blobbed the ball back to, to the pitcher. And it got me so excited because I'm like, finally, I'm getting to see somebody follow somebody hustling and not wearing my hat backwards or putting a chain on or having my pants above my knees. Because I think it's cool. Like something that is funny, <laughs> beneficial to hard work. And it's, man, I need more Ellie De La Cruz's in my life. Well, you're going to get that in picks one, two, and four of the draft we just had. Well, I schemed. He, UNLV was the first overall. He was the, we were number one in the conference because we won our conference. But we based it off of offense. And Air Force comes in, the, the lowest ranked seed last year. And I talked to some people, and they're like, yeah, they had two pitchers. One of them just shoved it, and there's nothing we can do. And I was like, that's what pitching is. That's what baseball is. You give me one good guy or two good guys, we come to the playoffs, you got a three out of five being set. 
I just need something like this. I didn't realize it was Mr. Paul Skeens or whatever his name is, the first overall pick in the draft. But, yeah, he was at Air Force doing this stuff too, but a lower name school, so he didn't get his publicity that he deserved. I'll jump. Josh, I can't believe you actually just went on that long-winded rant and actually hit every talking point I had. I, I was going to bring up games of the draft. I had Ellie De La Cruz and Corbin Carroll, and I had who is going to be the Padres leader. So I'll let you choose. Which one of those do you even want to go further on? What was the last one you said with the Padres? Who's going to be the Padres leader? Like that to, to us, we talked about it last week. They have no clubhouse leader. They have all the talent in the world. The roster is unbelievable, yet they can't put it together. It seems like there's no clubhouse presence to basically be the Roy Halladay. Isn't it crazy? It's crazy with what they have over there. And Manny started to do that. You know, we go through stages of this. We go through stages of life as well. And some people don't get past these certain hurdles. And Manny was this young kid that was about so many different things. And he finally got to a place where it was about the game of baseball, which was cool. So I thought Manny was going to be it for a second. Uh, back to Corbin Carroll, how lucky we get that he didn't get hurt. I thought he broke his whatever the other day, man, right before the All-Star game. Talking about a kid, again, like Ellie did the cruise, no disrespect, Mr. Carroll, because he hustles his butt off. So wow. this, maybe this new generation has given us what we deserve um, and miss for a long time. It's tough because I'm not in that clubhouse in San Diego, but you got guys like Fernando Tatis that we knew what this was about. The Padres knew what this was about before they gave him that contract extension but yet still gave it to him. And that's not the leader you want to take you long-term down the road. Um, but it's hard, man. You give me 300 million bucks as a 21-year-old kid. Bro, you guys don't know how wild we were at 21, but I promise you. <laughs> you know, we're this is crazy. 300 million and give me social media too. Uh, probably not going to be alive at this point in my life. <laughs> but, uh, it, 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 it's reputation preceded. It's also earned. I've always wondered about Xander Bogart. Some of us can't come over to a new house just because I get a contract and think that I can just take over and be the man. But yeah. Xander Bogart has earned a reputation where he possibly could have. So I, I kind of hope that maybe he would be that guy for a second. Um, big fan of him. But then you got, and this is, I don't know, I'm not internal, I don't know these guys, but yeah. then you got Jake Cronenworth, <clears throat> and he's such a better baseball player than what we're seeing. Like, he wants to be this flashy drop bombs type guy and he's I mean I think Jake could be a 330 hitter consistently and so we're missing something internally over there with coaching staff with on office with players with something to your right there is no leader you Darvish could be the guy but he hasn't really seemed to ever want to be I don't think Nelly Cruz is going to be around long enough to where he's willing to speak up uh, I don't know I, I think there's just a mixture of too many guys that aren't willing to be it and and if they do have somebody who's not willing to step up, I mean, it's, it's just a weird dynamic. This team should be so much better than they are. It's sad to see. I thought Josh Hader did uh, He went reverse, right? He was, he was mm -hmm. giving up a positive person in Milwaukee. He comes to San Diego, and, and next thing you know, he's – I don't know who he is anymore. I don't even know if he does anymore. <laughs> it's just – Yeah. There's so many good players, and, and it's like it, – it's our image, man. It's our image, and – and again, back to Ellie De La Cruz or Corbin Carroll, these kids are coming up from the minor leagues. We were taught when you got somewhere, be seen, not heard. And I love it, right? I shouldn't, if I'm new somewhere, man, you shouldn't hear me coming, right? I got to earn that. Um, and, and Corbin Carroll and, and Ellie De La Cruz, they have quickly become leaders of their staff, of their team. They're rookies, but they're leading by example. And we haven't seen that. San Diego does not have that guy, and it's sad to see. Juan Soto isn't playing well enough to be that guy. Um, I don't know, man. I, I love their head coach. I love the manager. He's fantastic. But sometimes as managers, again, we can't do it ourselves, and I definitely can't appoint anybody to do it. I think it's on the GM. The GM's going to have to figure this out. Josh, when you're on a team like that, do you know, like, can you tell that, just something just missing that year or are you just more focused on what you're doing or can you just kind of feel when the locker room is not quite right or like is there or it can also can guys come in like you said and like change it no you're good you didn't even have to keep going that was such a great question and i don't think many people are going to really understand what you asked um very hard to answer too because yeah. it's not again it's not it's not self-appointed necessarily 
Um, you can't, yeah, you can't just take the role because you want it, and it's not something that's overly discussed out loud as well. It's just. Some people are built to lead and some people are not. I mean, again, it's, that's why we have presidents, right? I mean, it's just, that's just because we voted for you, right? There's something about you that, that you've been, that your whole life has been, um, you have, that's put you in this position. And some people, like I said, have it. Roy Holiday didn't talk, y'all. He didn't say too many words. But I've never seen anybody command so much respect in my life the way this man did. Um, you just wanted to be a better person because you were in his presence. And some people have it and some people don't. And and, and, and you wish it could be you. Um, it's just something that it's just in there or it's not, to be honest with you. And, and I don't know how else to, to answer it, but when you find those people around baseball or around sports or around life, then you keep them. You know, you keep them on your favorites list, right? You keep them as, as friends of yours. When you meet that woman or that man, you keep them in your life if you can. Um, there's very few Roy holidays in the world, but there's a couple out there. Um, but you can't, again, you can't just appoint it. Uh, Joe, I want to dive in here. So we talked a little bit about the draft. You were drafted by Baltimore in the 15th round in 1996. And, you know, I saw a lot of videos yesterday up at the Cape Cod League. These guys were ready to go take the field, and they're, like, in the woods on the phone, and they're talking, and the players are running up and celebrating. Can you just tell – I'd love to hear a story. I thought of this today after thinking about those videos. Can you just tell a story about when you got drafted, maybe where you were and who you called first, or just give the overall experience that you went through? Uh, yeah, man. Well, it was, yeah, again, a different time, right? So, um, I was alone at my house, if I remember correctly, and we had the, the, the phone on the wall, right? And I remember my... <laughs> you got a page. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love those, uh, I love the social media where you have the rotary dials and kids don't know how to use it. It's so cool. Um, I remember my scout called me and said, I just wanted to let you know that we drafted you in this round. I didn't want you waiting by the phone all day uh, nervously, so I just wanted to let you know that uh, we drafted you, and um, I'll be calling you later and coming over to, to to discuss like contractual stuff. Like you know, we'll work on a bonus. We'll I'll see what the organization has as a number. You see where you're at, and then we'll we'll figure something out, which you can't do today. Like if I don't have a number preset today, then you're just not going to draft me because the allotment and the way it's changed. Um, so I thought it was really cool of him to to know that, you know, us kids are just waiting, dying to know if we're going to get our name called by who, by any of it, because you didn't know, right? It was just a different time. And then um, immediately I called my mom. She's at work. And then <clears throat> my dad growing up was only, he's only in one of three places. He was either, he used to shape surfboards. So he was either at the boatyard shaping a board. He was at uh, our house, or he was at the beach surfing. It was only one of three places. <laughs> oh, I went straight to the beach and let him know, and then uh, we got my scout and my uncle and, and my grandma and everybody at my house later on that week and, and sat down and, and, and you know, discussed the number. And I remember my scout telling me, um, listen, you don't have to sign. You can be a draft and follow guy. You can go back to college. And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, bro. <laughs> hey. You guys drafted me. I'm out. I don't care what it is. I'm <laughs> you waste your whole life in hopes for this nonsense, and you think that I'm gonna you think I'm gonna take a shot or not? No, I'm gone. I don't care what you guys do. Let's go. That's great. Yeah, it was cool, man. Good story, that Josh. I kind of want to go back to this season. So we talked about the Padres. We talked about they have on paper all the talent in the world. They they're not showing the the leadership aspect of this. There's a few teams that are kind of on that cusp that. They have the talent. They could really make a charge uh, for a postseason run or a deep postseason run. Phillies, Mets, Padres are kind of in that that realm. If you had to pick one of three teams to ride, um, even Boston, I think Boston, you could throw that in there too. If you had to pick one of those four teams to kind of ride as a, not a lock, but a team that you think is going to make that second half push, uh, for for any or whatever reason, what team are you kind of going with, or or if there's another one outside of those that you are kind of eyeing up? 
Yeah, again, there's a lot of, there's a few different things, right? Like, I'm just thinking about the pod just real quick because I got them up. And, like, I just don't understand how we use people sometimes. Like, I want to know my role, right? If you guys came in today and no one knew what they were doing and we turned this on, it would be, it would be a cluster, right? Like, I, I think about Nick Martinez, for example. Like, it seems like Nick's always somewhere in the mix and they rely on him, but I never really see him getting opportunities uh, and doing anything good with it. I think he has, like, five save opportunities and maybe one save. It's just... Like, I just don't understand why sometimes we're so afraid of change that we stick to what we have, all, even though it's not working. And sometimes you see teams doing that, which makes it very difficult. Name me those four teams again. I know you said the Phillies. And by the way, their bullpen has gotten so much better. They've addressed issues over the last few years of what they needed to address. Um, so I, I think what the Phillies are doing, again, we've seen them last year. I know that. And maybe unexpected. But they put themselves in a position, also, by the way, go getting top three best player in baseball and Trey Turner, another kid at Hustles. Uh, the Phillies have definitely put themselves in a position to stay here all year, so I like them. Who are the other ones? Uh, the Mets and the Red Sox. Yeah, the Mets. Uh, They're kind of in limbo. Yeah, I just, I don't, if you if you guys, and, and who does, right? I'm not on, on air enough at Beeson, so why would anybody really know this outside of my co-host? But, like, Every year for the last however many years, just cross the Mets off. They're out. They're, they're irrelevant. I don't care who they have on their team. They don't have anything in place. <laughs> that, 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 that the minor league system is in shambles. They don't have a structure. What does it mean to be a New York Met? We cannot answer that question. And I'm not saying this to be disrespectful. It's reality. Um, now, again, when I was coaching there, Brody Van Wagenen and Jared Banner have really put that organization in such a bad, bad place. They sold off the farm. We had no idea what development was. It was very hard to watch. And so they did set them back a few years. And so the Mets are reliant right now on free agency, which is not what you want to do. The other thing is, is they don't have enough time to, but they haven't had time to replenish the draft. With that said, a couple of years ago, they really messed the draft up. And no one knows this unless you have an internal tie. But they messed the draft up the Kamar Rocker year, not only not signing him, but then other things and players that they wanted surrounding him that they passed on because they, they gave him more money than they should have, but took away from money from other kids that they wanted. And they weren't able to get anybody. So they ended up missing with like the first couple picks, the first three picks. People don't know that. So it set them back another year there. So they're, they're, it's a very tough situation. So you go get Verlander, you go get Scherzer. It's great. Two of my favorite players in the game especially Scherzer, <clears throat> but there's no supporting cast and there's no depth. Um, it's tough for that organization. So right away, I can just cross them off. And you know, every year we get a new manager, we get a new this and that. It's so hard. At some point, you're just going to have to to trust somebody to put something in place, hopefully find the right person to work. It's not about them. It's not about me, man. My time's up. If I'm coaching, if I'm the GM, it's about this organization – the city, the fans, et cetera, um, they don't have that, and they still don't have it. They have beautiful players. Lindor, Pete Alonso, I love them. They have beautiful players, man, but they just don't have the internal structure that's going to put that team in a position to succeed. Um, I don't know, man. They sometimes you just got to step your toe, and I think they need to do that. Uh, give me another one. Matty, jump I'll, on in I'll here. Yeah, I'll fire one. Um, so you just brought up individual players. I want to bring up two and get your take on who's having a better year. Um, we know what Shohei's doing out there, both ways, hitting, pitching. But is Ronald Acuna's year as good as Shohei's is right now? Oh, my God. Acuna, I love him. I've, had, I've said some different things about Acuna and, and none negative because he's always been one of my favorite players. And I was always bothered when he signed that $100 million contract. And I remember people would be like, what is he doing signing this contract? Like, he, you know, he could have got so much more money, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, man, you guys, you got to understand where we're from sometimes. Like, where, where these guys are from and and the way of life and, and $100 million. And, you know, Acuna accepting a $100 million contract just showed a lot about who he is as a person and his character. I, I love him. I'm, I'm, he's one of my favorite players in the game of baseball. I've always been so curious of what his numbers would look like if we took him out of the one hole because his numbers, <clears throat> they're not on pace to be Hall of Fame numbers, right? Because, they're, you know, he's solo all the time. 
I would love to see him in the three or four hole. I bet he can put up 150 RBIs a year. I got this the guy can do amazing things. He's one of the best players in our game. His hustle, his smile, everything about this kid I'm in love with. Um, they might want to try to re-sign him right now, right? Lock him up. <laughs> Keep extending him. <laughs> Who's 40? It, it, again, I just love what he's doing right now, too, right? His numbers are probably kind of reflective of who he is. But, again, when you're a leadoff guy, um, runs are the only thing that, like, really is going to stand out because that's the only thing that you, you know, you're in a position to help other people out. Um, you look at his RBIs, right? He has 55 this year. 50, 52, and 64. And the other, he had one year, obviously, we had 101. But think about that, 50, 52, and 64. In three other seasons where it's like, it's like, wow, like you expect so much more. But he's a leadoff guy driving himself in when he's hitting, you know, 25 home runs or 24 home runs or whatever he's doing. Um, I think the sky's the limit with this kid. And I think the reason why we leave him where he is is because <clears throat> they have – arguably the best team in baseball and have for a very long time. They consistently replenish the organization uh, and then bring in the right free agency, trade for the right guy because we have so much depth. And Alex Anthopoulos is one of the last true GMs of the game to where he has created a winning team based on in-house development, mix in free agency when I need it, and I have plenty of depth because our minor league system has been the backbone to what we're trying to do. Acuna is a great example. You can't move him off these off this position while your team is this successful. Um, but one of these days, they're going to put him in a three hole. We're going to see this dude who has the RBI leader. Hank Greenberg is 190 or something. We might we might see this kid do that one day. Like I, I just think he's one of the best players we've seen in a long time. Better than, I mean. A little bit more power than Trey Turner, but again, on that level of Trey Turner, I mean, he's better than the Juan Soto's of the world by far. Um, it's tough to put anybody in Shohei Otani's world because, and I don't even think Shohei Otani's showing us what he's fully capable of because in some regards, he's got to stay healthy. Mm-hmm. But Shohei Otani's on just a whole other level of, I, I don't know, we can't compare him to anybody, right? Because he's so different. Um, but then again, it's kind of like Acuna, in my opinion. Who do you really compare them to? I mean, they're so good. They're so good. Jason, you got one last one for Josh? Well, I was going to say, uh, so we, we went through the, the dogs of the first half. What about the darlings of the first half? I think I know which team he's going to like. What about the teams like the D-backs, the Reds, the Marlins, the Rangers, and the Orioles? I'll put the Orioles in there. I, know, I think they're a little bit better than this. But which of those teams do you think is going to take off and which one do you think is going to maybe plunge a little bit here in the second half? You guys know I get long windy You start throwing 17 teams at me. I get stuck on the <laughs> We got the Rangers. We're in that, that category, um, kind of like the Padres, like we talked about a little bit, kind of like just a lost identity and who's leading or always changing something. Um, and I love Chris Woodward, one of my favorite teammates of all time. What a good man, a good family guy. Um, but they made necessary adjustments right after they got rid of Chris. Uh, and this organization, somebody did something somewhere and stepped up for this, for this team, and now we're seeing exactly what this team is capable of doing. Um, you look at Arizona, it just is the stuff about baseball that bothers me, is we're so caught up in, <clears throat> again, exit below and launch angle and all the stuff that's irrelevant to whatever. And Arizona, look at their lineup, look at their, their, their roster, like what is it? But they have these pitchers that have been this good, but – it's not sexy. They're not sexy, so they don't get the publicity. But the mirror carries of the world is Zach Gallon. Like, these boys are absolutely legit, and they have been legit. It's the reason they traded for him from St. Louis a couple of years ago. Like, this team has slowly been doing this, and then you, you get the right guys to the big league level at the right times, like Corbin Carroll. And he adds this inner excitement, um, and he gives this charge that Ellie De La Cruz gives Cincinnati Reds. And so... You have the right pieces, but you have the foundation set with the pitching staff first. And so then the Vegas boys like Nelson and the boys that, that aren't having the greatest of years, but they're having just the right amount mm-hmm. to fit in perfectly to what I'm asking you to do. Just like what the kids, the fifth starters are doing over in Texas. When uh, when Jacob gets hurt, right? You guys are filling in perfectly 
Um, that's the other thing. I was trying to pull up these team stats a minute ago. But when you look at, like, going back to the Reds for a second, I think the Reds are in first place. Mm-hmm. Um, like maybe negative six on the on the uh, power ranking, whatever the, the uh, whatever that red number is. <laughs> on the runs, I think? Yeah, this is the run differential, right? Low red number. You know, you look at their team stats, uh, and they're at the bottom in a lot of stuff, or you go to their team pitching stats real quick, sorry, which is the backbone, and their team pitching is 27 in baseball, right? It's, they're 50 and 41 with a 487. So it just shows you, like, there's many different ways to go about this. The Braves are this well-rounded team. Arizona's going about it with pitching and starting pitching, namely, but a bullpen that doesn't get much love. Um, the Cincinnati Reds are not going about it with pitching, but that game that Elliott and Cruz stole second, stole third, and then stole home on two pitches, that was the winning run of the game. Mm-hmm. Not one of the game, right? So they're doing enough to stay in the game and then finding ways to win the game outside of it. And so there isn't a textbook way on winning. We know that over 162 pitching is going to get it done. We know the back ones and winning teams of bullpen keep the game right where it is. <clears throat> but then if we're going to play a competitive game, how do I get this guy to second? First of all, how do I get him to first? He's still in first base these days. How do I get him to second? How do I get him to third with less than two out? How do I get this guy an opportunity to sack fly? Or the defense is back, so I get a ground ball just enough for so this guy can score. Like, there's teams finding ways to win. I think Texas is doing the same thing. Texas supports each other really well. Um, and so there is there is this cool dynamic around baseball. Tampa Bay has their own philosophy on how to win, and it's 100% bullpen only, right? So mm-hmm. there's a lot of cool things. The Baltimore Orioles, they have been sold off the farm a couple of years ago to get all these high first-round picks and all this massive depth. Uh, long enough to let their shortstop probably be the person we always thought he was going to be. So the Orioles are basing it off of, of young talent at the right time as well. Hopefully their GM knows how to keep these guys together long enough. That's the next hurdle. So there's a lot of cool things. And again, Cincinnati or Cleveland, they can't hit a home run, but they're in first place because their pitching always gives them an opportunity to win. And you talk about a leader, that their baseman is a true leader in that clubhouse where people love that young man. I love him. I think he's entertaining, but he's a hard-nosed baseball player who said, I know you would have gave me 150, 200 million. I think he got 150. I know you would have gave me 200 million, but I'll take less money to stay here because I love this place. I love my teammates. So give that money to some other people to help us win. I'll take less to stay here in Cleveland. Who does that? Roy Halliday brought him up. He did it. He told the Blue Jays, I do not want to be the highest paid player in baseball. So don't make it. Put that money towards somebody else. Bring in a fifth starter. Bring in an extra outfielder. Bring in somebody that can help us win. Because all I want to do is win. And he turned down money to do that. Like, that's why teams like that win. That's why Cleveland wins, because they have people like that on their side. It's fantastic. That's great. Well, hey, Josh, thank you so much, man. We know you're extremely busy, and we really appreciate you. You are our MLB guy. And we, uh, hey, man, and hey, you tell it like it is, and that's the way we like it on this show. So, man, hey, best of luck to you. We will be in touch. We'll get you back on maybe before, maybe before the playoffs. Yeah, I'd like to hear how, yeah, for sure, breaking down the playoffs and everything. We get tight, see who the contenders are late. That'd be be great. Thanks for, uh, Thanks for letting me talk and not let you guys talk. No, it's <laughs> hey, listen, no, it's, no. listen. The people want to hear. They want to hear from you. They don't want to hear from us. So that's the way it is. So, hey, buddy, thank you so much, man. We really appreciate your time, man. Best of luck to you, and we'll be in touch. Awesome, you guys are great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Have a good night. See you, yeah, Josh. Boy. All right, guys, why don't we take, okay, this is what we're going to do. I mean, we could break that down. I, that guy's just fantastic. Man. I want to go to Vegas and just man hang out with him for a night could you imagine the stories you know and the great thing tonight the holiday stories were fantastic oh yeah what a teammate that guy was i mean just a tragic story how his life ended and everything like that but to hear the stories that he broke down tonight about him that's pretty cool and especially at the end there talking not from a guy who's heard it a guy who's been a part of He's, it. He lived it, man. Yeah, he He's, lived it. He saw so, it. Yeah. He saw it. And to hear about a guy saying, I don't care about the money, get a fifth starter, get in bat, get somebody else that's going to win. That's what teams are about. Why don't we take about 
it, we're not taking a break. We're not taking a break. No, we, it, we, it's, it's fine. Okay, let's let's, let's just roll. Thing. Let's okay. We're gonna Scott. We're rolling hey, unless we're, we have to. Yeah. Hey, no, no break. No break tonight. Man. This is no. our show. We're doing it how we want. No, no stretch break. We're on the all star break. Somebody we can't have commercials. We got to keep this thing going. OK, man. So <laughs> are, are we are we are we going to. OK, let's. Smitty. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. Then, I just want to ask you a question. Yep. Hey, hey, Q. Yo. If we got together with Josh Towers in Vegas, do you think one of us would end up like that video I sent you guys yesterday, that naked dude on the card table? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, There's thought, a good. I'm not going to answer that truly. I'm just going to say that <laughs> the video was good, and we've not been put in that situation. <laughs> all right, that's all I wanted to know. I had a maybe settle aside. Who, 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 but as, as a betting money. odd, as the uh, to to lay an odd, I'm putting like minus two fifty. Was Jason the one that <laughs> yeah. said that's why I don't take insurance? I, was no, that, that, that was me. Oh, yeah, dude, yeah. that was great, man. Dude, I thought just spit my drink across. Tell me, the room. tell me that I, I'm not going to get into the story, but tell me that wasn't our buddy Musser when uh, we went out in March. Uh, tell, uh, we're not going to tell a story, but tell me that wasn't him. Uh, that was, he wasn't that bad. <laughs> <laughs> we were close. We were close. <laughs> <laughs> a chair got misplaced. Yeah, a chair. He a tripped chair. over a chair. A chair got tripped over. That's all. That's all it no, is. Hey, how about Caesar's Palace? That guy's throwing furniture down in the pool, twenty-eight stories up. I think that was our other guy. <laughs> our guy out in Colorado. Jeez. Yeah. Stuff out there. So, all right. Here. Okay. So break down golf. Okay, let's break yeah. down golf. Okay, we got uh, Scottish Open uh, this week. Man, we're doing good, guys. I had two winners. That's yeah, you guys are killing it. Three weeks in a row, man. A shank, man, so close. That was a good winner. Yeah, the one that that Sunday he was one. You hit him what? Top twenty? Top five? Top five? Top five? Yeah. Uh, my card. I had Shank top five last week, and I had Hubbard top twenty, which that was the easy. That's one. And everything. So I mean, not bad. I had Kirk. Kirk would have been a nice. I I added that onto the show last week, and I said I was going to do a winner, but I did a top five with him, and he was close, but just at the end it didn't happen. So. All right, here. I can't wait to hear the guys, uh, wh what they think here. I've been looking at this. So we got the Scottish Open. Hey, if you're up tonight uh, around 2.15 a.m., we usually try to get you some late plays, but there's no baseball. And I mean, so you can watch Nick at night or do whatever you want to. But if early morning plays here. 215 in the morning, first tee off is. So we're at the Scottish Open, Renaissance Club. I think it's a Tom Doak, if I'm saying that correctly. I think that's his name. Design. Uh, it's a par 70, 7,237 yards. You know, the thing with this course. You got to keep an eye on the conditions. Yeah. You know, the, wind, rain, wind, rain, everything like that. Tem Lat temps. It's usually they're in sweaters usually. Yeah. You know, sweater looks nice and that's not a bad. I'm, I look pretty good in a sweater. So uh, last year, Xander was minus seven. So that was a condition with the wind. Um, years 20 and 22, the wind conditions were bad. There was 15 to 35 mul uh, multiple day wind conditions. So this has been a winner at minus seven, minus 18, minus 11, minus 22. So everything I've heard so far, and maybe the guys, if they've studied a little bit more or heard something different from me, it sounds like you're going to get that little breeze off the sea here, about 15 miles. Doesn't sound crazy. There is some rain. I don't know exactly what time it is coming in here. These are big greens. I mean, these are greens that, like, if you get on a green, if we're playing, you get on the green, greens, you're probably, we're probably putting nine times just oh, to get easy. in or something like that. So, and they're slow. Chipping off the green. Yeah. <laughs> so, you might just pick the ball up and just drop it right <laughs> next to it if you're playing with me yeah. or something. So, hey, Maddie, let's start with you, my friend. Uh, where are we going here? Let's get some people, some winners here for the weekend. Well, um, this is actually a really loaded field. So this is tough. That's field, uh, I think. All the big names, all, yeah, all the big names went over early, of course, to get ready for the uh, British Open or just the Open Championship as it goes by now. I, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go against odds, and he's been super cold. And he's he looked like he was hungover at Wimbledon the other day. Looked like he had a really rough <laughs> night. But I, I, I think JT is actually a good play this week. Um He's, he's really good with his iron still. He just, he needs to put a round together and he just hasn't done it yet. But I think this is a good tune up. And then I got another guy who's under the radar and, uh, Min Woo Lee, who actually gets a really low ball flight and is good at playing these knockdown shots, which, with, which, with the wind is going to help 
So I'll give out my picks so far. I think I'm going to change it up, though. Hey, Matty, real uh, quick. Min Lee, let me jump in real Min, quick. He got second yeah. place last year, correct, in this? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Jason's saying Jason yes. Said yes so. Okay, okay. I think I think so. I think he was second last year in this. Okay, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. sorry. 21. No, no, that's, that's fine. So I'll go through my DFS lineup and the one that I put in my fantasy league, but I think I'm going to change it up because everybody has Thomas Dietrich, who is a solid play. But I have uh, Matthew Fitzpatrick, JT, Tommy Fleetwood, Min Woo Lee, Thorborn Olison, Ross Fisher, and Tom Kim, who has burned me. And I actually put Tom Kim on the no play list <laughs> along with freaking uh, – all my other uh, Coulter and these other bums, Billy Horschel, <laughs> just burned me. Thank you now. You yeah, don't talk Tom bad Kim about Billy. On there, so. Keep, Keep Billy out of your mouth. His performance at the quick and open there. Keep Billy out of your yeah. mouth. <laughs> have you have you not learned anything being on this show? Matt, you missed bad two shows. Any Florida people? He was here last week. Oh, I well, I guess, two, I'm saying two shows ago, we had this... Oh, you don't okay. talk bad about Florida. Players. I think we need to do like a we need to type up something each week and just say like the do's and don'ts, what you can say, and what you can. And every week, number one would be don't talk anything bad about Florida. Okay, Jason, go for it, my friend. Well, so I think this course is interesting because it's not a true links course. Like I, I've watched this a couple of years. They go it's a parkland course for the most of it. So there's trees, greens are protected. So it's not one of those deals where you know like they're going to hit the ball 30 yards down the you know short of the hole and it's going to run up and like that. So you get a little wind, a little protection, but it's kind of unique in that aspect. So my field here is I've got Rasmus Hoygaard, plus 320 for a top 20. He won last week um, in Denmark, which is a big deal for him is he's a Dane. Uh, I got Matt Wallace, who's a guy who's played really well here, and I'm going to take him plus 200 for a top 40, plus 550 for a top 20. Tyrrell Hatton, uh, plus 160 for a top 10. He's a guy who's played really well this year, and he's played really well at this course. Matt Fitzpatrick, another guy on horse for the course, plus 100 for a top 20, plus 200 for a top 10. And my uh, dark horse would be Alexander Bork. I don't think he's that much of a dark horse here because I think he and Smitty are both on him. I'm going to play him plus 120 for a top 40 and plus 700 for a top 10. He's got a good track record here, and he's actually playing pretty well. What do you got, Smitty? Yeah, I'm on Tommy Fleetwood here. Um, I looked at a couple people. I'm going to go Fleetwood. You know, Fleetwood usually doesn't win tournaments, but he's been playing okay. This is over in his neck of the woods a little bit. So I'm going to take a chance with him. So I played a Tommy Fleetwood to win and a top five this week. I'm going to go Matt uh, Fitzpatrick, um, top 10, plus 260. I'm going to try to take a chance with him, reading some things I like on him. You know, the one thing with Fleetwood, if you look back, let me, I jumped ahead a little bit here. Fleetwood, last year, fourth place, 26, and then second. So he does have some course history here and have done he's done okay so go back with fitzpatrick i'm gonna go that thomas dietry i jumped on top 10 with him plus 900. you know looking at some stats with him the um bogey avoidance he's like 11th overall looking at some things three putt avoidance he's seventh right now because again these are big greens so i looked at stuff like that so i'm gonna play him at that I'm, I'm, yeah, that Alexander York or Bork or whatever. I, just some things, uh, Jason, on him. You know, he's been in the top 10. You know, it's the DP World Tour, I think, seven times. Uh, last four, I think he's been in the top 10, the last four outings he's done. A lot of people like him. So I'm going to ride that train. Looking at some stats, I think he's there. And Lucas Herbert uh, is my best bet. Herbert, 100th last year in this tournament, 4th, 4th, 62. So, hey, let's just ride the trend and come back off that 100th last place last year and come back, and I'm going to do best bet on him, and I got him at plus 260. So there's the card. Three weeks in a row, man. Feeling good about golf. What would Tommy yeah, Fleetwood – I see his top 20. I'm sorry, Jason. What is Tommy Fleetwood's top 10? Oh, what's that? I see top Fleetwood, 20 is plus 110. If he was a horse, he'd be a board hitter, as they say. Like, he can't win it. But, you know, you put him in the trifecta, you put him in the exacta, and he'll get you there. This uh, I feel it. I feel it. <laughs> like, him, him, him top 10 would be a solid pick. Yeah, I like I, – yeah. Because he's always in that range. I like him in the top five. I mean, you look back, course history. Oh, no, yeah, for sure. You know, but, right there, too. So, I mean, you know, and here's the thing. You listen to so many of these shows, and this is hard. And we've talked about this on our show. 
the next next week's the British Open. So, you know, and Matt said this is really good card, and it is. You don't have Cam Smith, you don't have Kepka, and you don't have Ron playing in this. This is probably the best it's ever been with the names. Now, you listen to a lot of the experts. You know, I listen to our good friend Brady Cannon here and talk about and some of the, some of the other people on VSIN, and they go, some of these big names, are they just there to work on things? That's yeah. that's the hard thing with these tournaments, I think. So, you know, again, I think I I had a couple names. I think Cantley's a good name. I, I like that Min Wu Lee that Matt's on too. I had him down, just didn't make my card. Um Brian Harmon's another one that I saw I like some of his stats in this. I think that would not be a bad play, but we'll have to see how it plays out here. I mean, Matty, is there anybody that was close to your card that you were like kind of popping on some stats or just hearing other shows? You guys covered him. I mean, I, I like everybody you said. There is a guy, uh, let me pull it up real quick. I just got off it. You, Kevin Yu, I believe it is, is really good numbers wise. Like if you're just doing strictly a numbers play where he checks all the boxes off. Uh, let me just make sure I got his name right. I'm pretty yeah. sure that's it. Yeah, Kevin Yu. Yeah. Um, it, it, he's no one knows about. Like, and, and I'm looking at my starts. I have not played the guy all year. But when you strictly break down people's notes and then points and stuff on the internet, and you're like, man, this guy actually checks off every box. So he's a name that I might throw in to finish top 30. And you can probably get him at plus 200 something, I'm sure, because he's just some someone nobody knows anything about, really. Okay. Yeah. Did you jump in? Do we do we twist the arm and make it an after school special when you felt peer pressure and you had to jump in? It's it, from Chinese Taipei, well, but by I way like, of Arizona State. I mean, I at least know Fleetwood never wins, uh, you but he's always like a top <laughs> ten guy. Okay, let's get a bet. Get a bet in, uh, Jason. Give me that top yeah, ten again. Plus four fifty for top five, plus two hundred for top. 10. I want to make this. Show, I like top ten plus two hundred. I want to make this show like an after school special that we put peer pressure on you and you crumble. I'm in. Uh, okay, <laughs> right, there you go. Come on, everybody. <laughs> I like Fleetwood. Everybody's top. drinking before yeah. the dance cue. Come on now, let's go. Come on. I love it. <laughs> I was in the car. Let's go. <laughs> Come on now. Let's go. Listen, that's my, gonna hit. All, Come on now. You yelled at me last week about uh, the Wimbledon player that I named uh, Aria. Arena Sabalenka, I'm like, oh, she did good. Final four, um, and she Solid. has basically, basically what they're saying. And I got her at plus five hundred last week, um, which was a pretty good number. And Iga Swiatek out. So if she wins her match tomorrow, they're basically dubbing that the championship game already. They're saying she should cruise if she gets to the final. So I love it. Uh, hey, I'll take a plus <laughs> five hundred ticket. So we face yeah. a big dog, so you can actually hedge that if you wanted to. Matt, yeah, right I know. Right but I, I'm, I'm just saying, but she's no not get through. So no fire. hedge. Yeah, just fire. I like it. I like it. <laughs> you can hedge your big money. That's what the foul. <laughs> just they had feel street. good in your pick and just fire it. Let's go and stay with it. Well, guys, yeah, we got a bottom. Look at Kevin Yu. Can't putt. That's about the Kevin, biggest issue there, but that's not a big deal in Europe. So, Well, and I'm going to throw out another name uh, real quick to some shows. Gary Woodland. I, I love playing Gary Woodland. You know, one of the biggest problems with him is he can't putt. But some yeah. people said this is a guy that can hit it off the tee well, can get there. Big greens, slow greens. Does that help his putting? So there's another name for you. I mean, we're, we're throwing out more names either on our car, you know, not even on our card here for you. So, I mean, do what you want to do and try to cash. I think with putty, it goes both ways. I think there's some guys who like slow greens, and then there's some guys who prefer much faster greens because they can't putt. Like, was that Will Zalatoris on a fast green? I feel confident with. You put him on a green like this where he actually has to make a decent stroke, forget about it. But if he is like, Finau's a guy like that too, where you just tap it, he's fine. All right, guys. I think that's about it, man. You know, yeah. it's great to have Josh because, you know, Josh tells it like it is, like we said. And, I mean, he, he talks. Raw, unedited. And he, and he talks. Yeah, I love and it. And I like it, man. So, I mean, he really went into some great stuff tonight. A, um, and, you know, there's not a lot to cover. And, man, that guy. And I think it was cool that we had him on before baseball. Now at the break. Now at the break. And, I, you know, I like to hear what he had to say there. And, again, yeah. I really enjoyed the Roy Holiday stories tonight. So, 
if you're a holiday fan, maybe we'll have to put that on Twitter to make sure you listen to some of the stories that he told about him. But uh, anything else good for the group this week? Jason, anything, man? Are you riding anything tomorrow, like Canadian football or anything? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not going to follow you on your tie cat bet for tonight. Uh, <laughs> That's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. I oh, went tomorrow? with Joe. Okay. I went okay. with Joe. Jeez, I went... get football tonight? Come on. There's Joe... a bet. There MLB. It should be like all Canadian football games. That was a Joe Osborne. Uh, I forget who he's working with now. Is it covers? Did he bounce the covers? I don't know. He had he had good numbers on that. He did. And I thought I thought it was tonight. <laughs> I was born. <laughs> I mean, now the good thing is I, I'm up here and I'm with you guys and everything. Now I have American Pickers taped, so when I can go home tonight, I can watch American Pickers the new uh, <laughs> episode, and everything's good. And if I wake up at two fifteen in the morning, I can see some golf. So Man, you got to watch the you gotta watch the Bear. That's a great show that we've been watching. Yeah about a like chef in Chicago. I'll tell you right now, you can actually put it in Pittsburgh. It would work the same way. They pretty much have the same accent and the same swear words and everything. So, all right, nice. there you go. We're giving out shows now too. Maddie, any final comments on this lovely yep. Wednesday evening? Absolutely. Since we talked baseball, there's a really big series, especially for the Arizona Diamondbacks this weekend. So this is the first time they're behind in the standings or maybe they're up a half game, whatever it is. They're being pushed for the first time all year, and they actually have to go on the road to Toronto. Tough place to play, and they're going to get Toronto's probably best three pitchers, and Arizona is not starting their best three pitchers. So huge series for the D-backs this weekend. Keep an eye on that one. All right. Q, anything? I got nothing. I'm just waiting for baseball to get back. Okay, there we go. I'll start dabbling after the College World Series. <laughs> 17 and 14 plus 1.78 units. Oh, crushing it, buddy. Good job, man. I'll get back up there. No, oh, you're crushing it. He was it. actually reading the press clippings for Kyle Trash. Don't worry oh, about it. Oh, Save those the, cards. The K was a little soft there. Oh, <laughs> Save those cards. I got, I got a card sent out every week. I want to bring the, the card up and give it to you. You I'm losers. Gonna... It'll be worth something one day. <laughs> I'm going to give it out to a kid in my classroom for like a, a good, good Just job. slide in his pocket tell him to open it up after class. <laughs> good job. For when the he week, leads the because... Argonauts to the Grey Cup, that card <laughs> yeah, is going to be worth something. That might be something. There we go. <laughs> hey, listen, everybody, check out Wild Style Network, man. There's some great shows. And, man, if you're into music, stand up and shout. I know I am. And that kicks concert. I still enjoyed that so much. And those guys are crushing it. A Tribe Called Jess. And, again, that is... The girl, man, she tells it like it is too. If you like hearing, we can't that, give you a script of what's going to be covered. It's different every week. No, it's it's it's, but it's, it's you, you get sucked in. You listen to it. Yeah, I do every day when I walk, man. When she does the show, I listen to it and I listen to the music show, and I love it. So, everybody, tune in to all the shows here at Wild Style Network. Until next week, Q. What do we always say? Bang your bookies.